Good day, folks. I'd like to talk to you today about the heavy side component of the one wire system. A lot of people are very interested in this concept that I've been talking about lately, but there's always a lot of questions and I try to answer and I've been trying to um, give out the point and I don't think, well, about maybe half of uh, the people watching understand and it's unfortunate because the majority, I would say, is um, not understanding what I'm getting at here. Um, what I've been trying to say is the heavy side, which is also known as the pointing vector, which we've talked about in the field here, could be captured with the one wire system, usually a neglected part of the uh, traditional electrodynamics, which is very well there in the original Maxwell 20 variables. So there is nothing um, wrong with this. The science is there, but as I've said before, it just got conveniently shoved under the rug, right? Because one of my big points, would I, which my, myself and people like Tom Bearden would say, you know, it's not really cool if you can't charge anyone for it right so let's not uh, build society around this concept right but as far as the physics the science and even the validation it's all accepted science and I even have the formulas for it in other videos so this is all real stuff and what's interesting with the heavy side field is it's expressed as a field in watts per meter squared so it's very powerful field that basically converts the pure potential very significant at high voltage, like 150,000 volts, and then we actually get the equivalent of watts back in the field strength. Now the uh, challenge remains in reflecting that field and efficiently capturing it to take advantage of that extremely potent power which is confined in the surrounding area, the environment, in other words, around the wire here. So, uh, as I've explained in some uh, earlier videos, this is very interesting because it solves the problem that we have of being able to, um, where we can't do this in the traditional closed uh, loop for reduced, the fourth set of reduced, the revised Maxwell equations, which only gives us four variables instead of 20. Uh, we cannot convert pure potential into current because wouldn't that be great, right? we would be able to directly engineer the power we need just by bringing the voltage up to a certain value, which we all know doesn't require current to increase voltage. It won't be very powerful, but if all we need is voltage, we have ample methods to create a high voltage field and use that to trigger the heavy side component. Now again, the challenge remains in maximizing a system to capture but needless to say very much like a windmill system or a solar system let's say we're only able to capture 17 percent of that well let's say 17 percent of 100 watts when you're only using maybe 40 milliamps to trigger the whole thing is still a gain money wise at the end of the day again not energy that comes from nowhere just an efficient transfer conversion of energy which is completely accepted and allowed in the traditional uh, 20 variables of Maxwell. Now of course there's complicated setups and with the Bedini systems a way to keep the loop closed and not only physically keeping the loop open in the circuit but literally closing the, the and opening the loop by pulsing the DC, go and pulse DC. So in the Bedini system, you're not only physically keeping the loop open for a moment, but you're breaking it electrically as well. So by doing that, you introduce systems, a frequency component and resonance. So let's say you want to have a system to, if what, because there's so many ways of doing it. Let's say you're good with resonance and Tesla coils and such. So if that's going to be your method, then you're going to use resonance to bring the voltage up to 150,000 volts. You can do that. Tune your system to the frequency you want to use. But the important factor with the heavy side is it's not a frequency dependent. And that's the key thing that I've tried to explain. And I think a lot of people are not understanding what I mean. You don't need to be East AC. You don't need to be pulse DC. Just a DC static field, even from an electric, is enough to trigger the heavy side, the pointing vector of the field. Now, if you're wondering what the pointing vector is, um, 
I'm not very good at drawing, but you can look it up. It's essentially, if we're dealing with an AC waveform, this is how it would look like. And the pointing vector is actually the direction and the magnitude of the field, where the energy is being propagated. So, as you see here, there's these little arrows that go like this, like that, and change direction along as the field changes. So that's the magnitude direction and all of this in here is essentially that, that heavy side component that shows up as a kind of field which is comparable to RF but it isn't RF. It's a field but it is also expressed in watts per meter squared. So the heavy side is all this stuff in here and the magnitude, the direction of it. Now this is AC. Keeping it very simple an AC waveform looks like this. So what's the heavy side? Well, it's pretty easy. There it is. It's stable and it's constant and it only goes in one direction, straight out. So we have a heavy side. It's just more static with DC in the direction at the given time of the cycle. So that's the key point here is we can tap into the heavy side with static DC fields. And in my opinion, creating a static DC field is much more simple than trying to work with resonance system, pulse systems, Don Smith-like devices. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, folks. If you're advanced and you're willing to go in that direction, you can. But all I'm saying is there are much more simpler ways of tapping into the heavy side than having these complex systems. It could be a system as crude as having a couple of thousand 9-volt batteries all connected in series and the last battery here is going to have like 2,000 volts of DC. So there's your... So now the issue with this though, folks, is for this to work, you need to trigger a field, right? So technically, like if you were to use a battery here, did this prom here and this one here, your plus and minus, these, as little as the contact leads here are, these would be considered capacitive plates, okay? But because the two batteries are too far away, the two plates can interact because the air, the dielectric, you know, the distance is just too far for the given voltage, you see? So how do you correct that? Well, it's very simple. You set up two plates, two large plates, you put them in close proximity, but not close enough that they would arc, so you connect your high voltage plus here and your vo high voltage minus here. Now what happens is you have an equivalent of an air capacitor, the air in here being the dielectric. So all you need is the additional displacement energy, which is just very little to initiate that field. Then you've got a static field that radiates from here. It's DC. It won't require continuous regaging because you're not closing the loop. We don't want to discharge or short this capacitor here. We want to use it to just like a Tesla coil uh, capacitor plate. We want this to be charged and we want to generate our field. So we generate our field. So what we do is we can have plates because we have a static field here all around here. So we can set up various plates around here all on your one wire diode systems with your cathode and anode, your plus and minus, your plus and minus. And here's how you tap into this field. Very simple with just a pure DC. No AC, no frequency components. People are, I was trying to explain this in other videos, folks, and people are asking me questions. Well, you didn't specify what frequency. You didn't specify this. And, no, I'm trying to tell you, you don't need to do any of that in this case. So this brings us to even more exciting uh, possibilities. I've talked about the Zamboni pile, which is essentially a type of galvanic cell with a thousand or more plates all stacked, usually a, a thin piece of paper for the electrolyte and it uses the moisture in the environment. I don't want to do it that way. It's too sloppy. I'm looking at for actual solid state electrolyte to make this more efficient. I'd like to stack it up, my Zamboni piles here, 
so that I can have, you know, many thousands of volts, maybe 10 kV or more at the end of these cells and do the very same thing with the capacitor here. Not have them actually short out, but enough to interact to create a high voltage potential field and just use that as the trigger with very minimal current. And the Zamboni pile folks could provide power as pure potential for a lifetime or more, especially if you build it with non-corroding parts and a solid state electrolyte, this could last a long time and it could be your trigger and you don't even have to worry about frequency, AC pulses, DC pulses. Yes, it's a very crude system, but at its um, basic form will work if you've got the time to build these galvanic cells and remember, you can simulate it with 9-volt batteries or any kind of batteries, but the issue with batteries is even if you don't close the loop, after a year or so, they naturally, by the design of chemistry, will become weak. So technically, after about a year, the static field here would diminish with traditional batteries. So instead, I say dump the traditional batteries. They're no good, not good for the environment even. Build the Zamboni pile instead and use that to trigger your field, which triggers the heavy side because let's say we bring this up to 150 kilovolts. That means if you do the math, there's a potential for, you know, 40, 50, 60 watts of field strength here. We just need to figure out how to tap into that and it will continuously re-gauge itself. So here's a great way, again, a variant of the earth battery. So if you want to experiment with earth batteries, I'm sure you could um, get similar results. You would probably not have room for a thousand or 10,000 plates for earth batteries. So I could just assume you would introduce a pulse DC resonance and a system, you know, like a Bedini or an oscillator, a boost converter, something like that to use, you know, the 10 volts or so you get to raise it up with, with uh, pulse DC. No problems with that. That'll work too. And at the end of the day, as long as you can convert that to, to, to DC with your diode plugs, you're good to go. But my point is you don't need to use frequency for the heavy side. You don't. Which could really, depending on the design or the idea you want to work with, really simplifies the concepts and this is what I was trying to explain and I hope that I uh, clarified it a little bit for everyone here so with that said folks always looking forward to your comments and have yourselves all a wonderful day thank you